As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam. Ala Sayyidina Mursalina Sayyidina Muhammadi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam. Rabbil shahli sadri wa sirli amri wa halal uqtatam min nisan yafqa wa qawli amin. Qallahu ta'ala fi kitab al-majeen. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa radhidu lakum al-islam deena. Bismillah. So, today obviously we'll be talking about Umrah. Umrah as, as I'm sure most of you know, each of the pillars of Islam are, it's obligatory, but each one has an associated recommended act with it. And so the, and, and so for example, with the, with the testimony of faith, the recommended act that, that's associated with it is sending salawat on the Prophet وسلم. With your or obligatory prayers, there are recommended uh, prayers. With zakat, there's recommended sadaqah, etc. So the recommended act that pairs with Hajj is Umrah, and that's why it's called the minor pilgrimage. When Allah um, obligated Hajj on us, he revealed the ayah that today I perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you, and I am pleased that Islam be your religion. In other words, Hajj is considered the, is considered the final ibadah. It's the final thing that you do in your life. It's the thing that you do right before you die. And in many ways, the, both the Umrah and, and the Hajj specifically are uh, preparations for death. And so there is a, and so when someone goes uh, to Umrah, when someone goes to, to Mecca and Medina, there's a stripping off of all your property, there's a stripping off all, of all your clothes. And you, um, uh, and you look the same as everyone else, because when we're resurrected on, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, we'll be resurrected without any clothes on. But we'll be so frightened on that day that we won't you know, be looking at each other on that day. But everyone will, will be the same. There will be no material differences or variances between people. Um, and additionally, the, um, we'll see this as we go through. Um, what you're doing in, in the Hajj is reorienting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and obviously the same in the Umrah. When you're making tawaf, you're circling around the Kaaba. And we know that the Kaaba physically is just stones. But at the same time, somebody who worships the stones has actually left Islam. We don't worship stones, we worship Allah. And, this, and the stones is just the place that Allah has set as, as a representative of him. And so outwardly, externally, the Kaaba is just stones, but internally, its internal reality is as the house of Allah. Again, this reflects the state of the heart and what the human being should be doing in all of life. Um, we begin whenever we recite the Quran or, or, or almost anything with um, the dua, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. I seek shelter in Allah uh, from the accursed Shaitan. What does that literally mean? To seek shelter means that you're, you've compared Allah to a house. That house is what protects you and Allah is what protects you. In other words, the Kaaba is the house of Allah and your heart should be a house of Allah as well. Just as Allah protects you, just Allah protects people in, in the Kaaba and uh, it's a sacred area and there are and to commit a sin in, in, in Mecca or Medina is much more grievous, a thousand times more grievous than, than committing a sin elsewhere. Similarly, Allah protects your heart. The ideal person is someone who makes uh, his heart the Kaaba, as it were. So let's begin uh, by going over some of the fiqh. So the, so the Umrah has four requirements uh, to, to, to fulfill. Um, if, you have all, if, if you do all of these, you've completed the, the Umrah. If not, then either you need to repeat your Umrah or you need to pay some sort of penalty, which we'll go over. The first one is Ihram, second one is Tawaf, third is Sa'i. Sa'i is, is running between Safa and Marwa. And the fourth is the haircut. So to begin, uh, Ihram has several components, the first of which is the garment. Now, before, before we put on the garment, you know, we'll, we'll do that in Istanbul, inshallah. 
the preparation for Umrah begins before Istanbul. It begins when you leave here, when you leave your home. Um, whenever, you know, because the meaning of Umrah is to go and to get ready to, to meet your Lord as though you're dying, you should say farewell to everyone here. I think as, as my dad was saying, if there's anyone who um, you need to seek forgiveness from, if there's any debts you need to uh, repay, all of those sh should be done as much as possible before you leave. And so you should prepare and, um, and make dua and, and ready yourself uh, to, to meet your Lord. Uh, practically, what this also entails is, you know, if you're coming straight out of work and then getting on a flight, and then uh, you're going to be in, in Istanbul in 36 hours, you're, that's not enough time to get out of like the the working busyness m mindset into the mindset of service and being humble before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So I, I'd highly recommend before you leave, spending half a day, one day, just clearing your mind, clearing your your search, not not doing anything, and just preparing your heart. Um, being in a state of ibadah, reading something about, about the Hajj or the Umrah, or, or um, reminding yourself in various ways, uh, reading some of the dua books that we'll mention. Um, that way, when you reach uh, Umrah, your heart will be ready for it. You won't, your mind won't be distracted with other things. Um, before you leave, you should read two, two rakas. This is just recommended, not, not, not required. And then when you land in Istanbul, obviously you'll need to leave, leave the plane. Uh, and then when you get to the Jeddah gate, you should go to, uh, this is for men, you should go to, to the restroom, change into what are essentially towels. And then you can make your intention and so on and so forth. The rules for, for the garment are as follows. You cannot wear anything stitched or sewn. Anything stitched or sewn that covers a limb. So the exception here are belts. You can wear stitched belts because stitched belts don't cover a limb. They just, you know, hold your, uh, um, you know, hold your um, your lower garment together. Um, the stitches, the reason stitches and sewing are not allowed is stitches represent something, which is your attachment to this world. Remember when when you're going to Umrah, you're stripping off everything of the world. You're stripping off your clothes even. And so you can't wear anything that's tying you to, to this world. You're getting ready to go to the Akhirah. You're getting ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want any attachments left. And so the stitches likewise have to go. They're symbolic of letting go of the dunya. Um, you can wear a belt. Uh, if you buy one of those ihram packages, they'll often come with a belt. Or you can just wear your normal belt uh, if you prefer that. Uh, you can wear sandals and, and flip-flops where the top is exposed. Meaning that, uh, imagine if this is your foot. You can't have something that's going to cover most of the bone of the foot here. What you need is, is, is the type of flip-flop where you have one, one thing that comes up and turns into two prongs. That's sort of a, a flip-flop. It's like the, if any of you have seen like the thick Adidas slippers, those don't work. But other flip-flops will work. And you can, and actually should, uh, wear a small traveling pouch around your waist, and that will carry your um, your phone and, and your wallet and whatever else, whatever other necessities. Um, for women, you can wear any type type of, of clothing. However, because of the spirit of of the Umrah, it, it's recommended that you wear something plain, uh, and uh, that it's it's mostly white or mostly black. Um, uh, women can't wear a niqab, and that includes a mask, and, and that also goes goes for men. You can't wear anything covering your face, mask or or anything else. Um, both men and women should not wear uh, gloves, although there's one school that allows it, so it's not entirely prohibited. And and, and similarly, women like men can wear uh, pouches to carry their things. Any. Any questions on this, on the garments? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, gla uh, glasses are fine, contacts are fine. Um, you can't cover your, your head, though. Uh, so anything that would cover, you know, any, any sort of head covering, any sort of hat, any sort of kufi wouldn't be allowed. But yeah, glasses, eye contacts are fine. 
Bismillah. So once you put on the ihram garments, uh, then you need to uh, make your intention for entering into the state of ihram. Now, what do we mean by, by the state of, of ihram? All of you know that when you begin your prayers, you begin with a takbir, right? You begin with saying Allahu Akbar. That takbir is called takbir al ihram. It's called takbir al ihram. It's the Allahu Akbar, you say, to enter into a sacred state. Ihram means to make sacred. So you enter into a sacred state. When you're making the intention of ihram, what you're saying is, I resolve to begin my umrah and to resolve, and I resolve to enter into the sacred state with, with Allah. That sacred state is the state of being a faqir, someone who's needy, someone who's a beggar, someone who's in utter humility before Allah. And that's why I will we'll talk about it more, but a person should always be in the state of talbiya, always telling Allah, Ya Allah, I'm at your service right now. Oh Allah, I'm here for you. Oh, Right now, I acknowledge your lordship as you are, um, as is uh, worthy of you. And so the intention doesn't need to be verbalized. The intention is just resolve in the heart. If you want to verbalize it, you can say something along the lines of, Oh Allah, I intend Umrah, so facilitate it for me and accept it from me. You are the all-hearing and the all-knowing. Um, once you make this, this intention, then you need to say the talbiyah at least once. But the sunnah is to do three times. And that's labbaik Allahumma labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'amata laka wal mulk, la sharika lak. At your service, Allah, at your service. At your service, you have no partner. At, at your service, all praise and blessings belong to you as this dominion. You have no partner. And so you repeat this three times. And then afterwards, you heard, um, between uh, you entering into the state of ihram and entering into the masjid, a person should always be repeating the talbiyah constantly. You, you, can, you can obviously stop to, to make du'as or if you need to uh, say some, you know, just say some things to, to your neighbor or something, that's fine. But the idea is you're in a state of sacredness before Allah. You're in a state of humility and worship before Allah. And you should always be trying to be in a state of dhikr, in a state of remembrance of Allah, invoking Allah, and specifically with this talbiyah. And then after you make your, your talbiyah, then you've entered the state of ihram. And as we'll get to, there's certain things that are prohibited when, when you're in a state of ihram. And that's when those prohibitions begin, once you've said your talbiyah. And then it's recommended to send prayers, salawat on the Prophet ﷺ, and to make dua for yourself and for others as well. Oh, sorry, there was one more thing I meant to mention. Before the intention, before you get onto the flight, the... Um, it's recommended to pray two uh, two rakahs of a prayer. This isn't required. This isn't required. It's just nafil. Uh, in the first one, to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, Allahu Ahad. And in the second one, to er, sorry, in the first one, to recite Surah Al-Kafirun, Qul Ya Ayyuh Al-Kafirun. And in the second one, to recite uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas, Qul Allahu Ahad. So um, you put on your uh, the ihram garment. Uh, pray the, the two recommended rakahs, make your intention and then talbiya, and then you've entered into the state of ihram. Now, what do we mean by ihram? What do we mean by the sacred state? When someone enters into ihram, you're in a state where you're going before Allah as if you were dead, as if you had been, as if you've died and been resurrected. In other words, there's no grooming in this, um, uh, at this point. You're before Allah, there's no lewd speech, there's no argumentation, um, sp specifically as well, uh, hunting and, and, and marital and intimacy are both pr prohibited. So grooming, what do we mean? Uh, you can't trim, trim your nails, you can't remove hair from any part of the body, uh, even if that's like rubbing your head and, and hair falls down, you should um, refrain from that as much as possible. You can't apply oil to, to your hair, uh, you can't touch perfume, and that's why of uh, the warnings against touching soap or touching um, shampoo because that will put, that'll get, get perfume, perfume on you. Uh, it's prohibited to touch perfume with your clothes or with your body. Another thing to understand is once you're at, once you're at the Kaaba, oftentimes the kiswa of the Kaaba will have perfume on it as well. So when you're doing Umrah, if you have the chance to, to go all the way up, 
up to the up to the Kaaba, there might be perfume on the Kiswa, so don't actually touch it. Uh, maintain some distance from it. So all of these things have to do with grooming. The person is not allowed to do these things. Additionally, like I mentioned, hunting, marital in in intimacy, and just general argumentation are all prohibited in this state. Um, argumentation is always prohibited, but it's a especially severe uh, sin at this time in, in this state. What can you do? Uh, you can take a bath and take a shower, or you can scratch an itch as long as you're careful that no hair falls out, and you can wear a ring or a watch, even though this isn't recommended. It just wouldn't, um, uh, it wouldn't uh, result in a penalty. If you do anything on the left-hand side, that will require some sort of penalty to be paid. I, I don't have all that listed because the details can be quite, quite lengthy, but if it happens, let me know and I will figure out how much that, that exactly is. It usually isn't too much money. Yeah, so, so, so if you do... It, it, yeah, sorry, so if you do accidentally end up trimming your nails or some hair falls out or something like that, then there's a penalty to be paid for that. Yeah, so when you... Uh, uh, once, uh, once you arrive in Jeddah and you're checked into your your hotel, there might be time to take a very quick shower or, or to change or to wash up or something. Yeah, and then we'll um, uh, go to the Haram to begin the Umrah. Uh, yeah. So when uh, after you leave, so after your hair is cut, then you'll leave the state of, the state of the Haram. You can continue to to enter into the Haram do tawaf, do, you wouldn't be, do, be doing sa'i. But at that point, you don't need to be in, in the towels anymore. And so there's no restrictions on you in terms of the things we just mentioned. Um, ihram, when do we put it on? Now, you'll notice here on the right-hand side, you see essentially an area laid out with boundaries. These boundaries are called the miqat. And so the Prophet Wasallam told us that anyone who passes these boundaries intending to do umrah or hajj, must enter into a state of ihram before crossing the boundary. This is for someone who's coming from outside of Mecca, as we will be, because we'll be coming from Istanbul. What that means is when the plane's flying in, at some point it's going to cross one of these, these boundaries. At that point, you have to be in a state of ihram. But you won't know exactly when that is. You won't know exactly when that is. So what does that mean? You should put on, uh, uh, basically, you should put on your garment and pray in Istanbul before you leave, uh, for sure. In terms of making your intention and reciting the Talbiyah, I would personally recommend doing it right when you board. Just so that if you want to sleep on the flight, if you forget, you're already in a state of Ahram. However, you can wait, and about 45 minutes before the plane reaches uh, Jeddah, you'll be crossing the border. So here I've written down one hour around one hour before arriving, then you can make your intention and do your talbiya. And uh, so that should be fairly sh straightforward. If you're, now, after we do our umrah, you can choose to do a second umrah or a third umrah if you like. To do so, you need to enter back into a state of, of ihram. What does that mean? You need to go, go out to a miqat boundary and then you need to come into a state of ihram, wear, wear the garments, make your intention, do your talbiya, and then come back. The miqat boundary for Mecca, if you start within Mecca, is Masjid Aisha. And so if you want to go, every taxi driver, every bus driver will, will, will know what, what, what Masjid Aisha means. You get in, into a taxi, it'll be about a 20-minute drive to, to Masjid Aisha. There you make your intention, say your talbiya, and come back. And now, now you're in a state, a state of ihram again, and you have to complete um, the, uh, the Umrah rituals before you exit the state of Ihram. And, uh, uh, any questions on Ihram before we move on? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, 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 I think so. They, um, it, it usually doesn't take too long to figure out where things are, and it, 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 once you've done it once, it's pretty straightforward to know what you're doing. Yeah, go ahead. So for your second, you, you don't have to care. You, so you just go back to, 
to the barber, they'll just do do a one over and take off whatever bits you might have, and that's it. They have clippers and they have blades uh, for shaving. No, uh, go ahead. Sorry, the Umrah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other? Yeah. Yeah. So your intention in your Umrah, uh, your first Umrah should be done uh, with um, for, for yourself. Um, I won't get into the fact of it, but but you should do it intending it to be for yourself. Afterwards, you, you can do intention and combine multiple uh, intentions together. So you can do it on behalf of 10 different people all at the same time. And then, Ahram, going once, going twice. Let's go. OK. So uh, um, when you enter into the Kaaba, um, there's some landmarks you should recognize. The first one is going to be the black stone. Um, you won't see the black stone. There will be a huge crowd around it, unless it's prayer time, in which case, as you can see here, um, they'll have blocked off the, uh, the area, and you'll probably see uh, some guards uh, standing by it. After the black stone is the Hijra Ismail. So if you look on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side of the Kaaba here, that's where the black stone would be on that corner. You go around one corner, you're at the Hijra Ismail, which is also known as the Hatim. The Hijra Ismail is important because this originally used to be a part of the Kaaba. And there's some disagreement on whether it's the entire space or just a, the space marked here. But in any case, this was the original part of the Kaaba. When the Kaaba was destroyed and rebuilt, the Kaaba was made smaller. And so praying in this area is a really special place in, in the world to pray because you're praying within the Kaaba. You're praying within the original Kaaba. And this is a place where your dua is accepted, your dua is mustajab. So it can be quite hard to get in here. There's a lot of uh, traffic and crowds, obviously. Um, that's the significance of that place. And then the other place to know is the Yemeni corner. The Yemeni corner is right before the black stone. So here, where it says Rukun Aswad, that's the black stone. Rukun Iraqi is where the Hijra Ismail begins. So before you, if you're going, uh, if you're going counterclockwise, then the one before the black stone is the Yemeni corner. And the Yemeni corner is a, is a place that, that, you, um, that when you're doing tawaf, you, um, you make special uh, dua at, uh, specifically because it's associated with the angels and the acceptance of, uh, of dua. And then lastly, the, the last place to know is the Maqam Ibrahim. The Maqam Ibrahim is that gold structure. Inside of it, if you're, if you're able to look, is a footprint of, of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, and it's protected by this, uh, this glass casing. This is next to the black stone, so the, the left side of the Kaaba right now is the black stone. If you come out, and on the right hand side is the Hijra Ismail, and the Maqam Ibrahim is over here. So this will help, help you get your bearings for, um, for where you are around the Kaaba. You begin your tawaf and end your tawaf at the black stone, and, and there will be a, a green light on the opposite side, um, uh, uh, on the mushid side, which will tell you that this is the place that you begin your, your, your tawaf and end your, your tawaf. So you'll start there and start going around. Now, so the Kaaba obviously is a place of um, many secrets and a greatly honored place. The first sighting of, of the Kaaba is especially uh, something sacred and something that, that stays with you um, for the entirety of your life. And so from the time that you enter into uh, the state of, of Ahram to the time that you um, uh, begin the Kaaba, there, or the time you see the Kaaba, there are several things that a person should do. For, first of all, obviously, be conscious and mindful of Allah in every moment and every act, because this is a particularly sacred state, to constantly chant the talbiya. Again, you don't need to be shouting it, just at a medium pitch is fine. When you enter Mecca, there's a dua you should make, that you're entering the haram. 
The haram is a sacred place. It's a, it's a place that things are forbidden. And so there's a dua that you should make here that you yourself are made forbidden from the fire just as you're entering into a forbidden place, into a sacred place. Then when you enter the masjid itself, once you're into Mecca uh, and then into the masjid, then you, uh, and you're passing through the doors of the masjid, here is where you make the dua, Allahumma iftahli abu abu rahmatik. Allah, open for me a, the doors of your mercy. So just as you're passing through, through the doors uh, of the masjid, this is like passing, into, uh, passing through the doors of Allah's mercy. When you enter, uh, sometimes you might be able, if you keep your head up, you'll be able to, to, to catch a glimpse of, of the Kaaba. It's recommended to keep your head down and, and, and we'll be guiding you through all, all the crowds and, and where to go. Keep your head down until you're in the Mataf. The Mataf is the bottom floor where the Kaaba is. When you reach that area, then raise your head. Because then, at that point, the first time that you put your eyes on, on the Kaaba, this is another place that dua is accepted. So here, in a state of utter humility, is where you, um, you, want, to, you want to praise Allah and glorify Him, and, uh, and then send, send prayers on the Prophet وسلم, and then make whatever du'as you'd like to make. Tawaf itself. Tawaf is seven circuits, beginning at the black stone and ending at the black stone. One of the conditions of Tawaf, as opposed to Sa'i, is you have to be in a state of Tahara, you have to be in a state of ritual purity, meaning you have to be in wudu. If you break your wudu doing, doing tawaf, you have to go out, make wudu, and come back in. If that happens after the fourth one, come see me, we'll talk about what to do, because there's some detailed rulings there. But in general, you need to be in a state of, um, of, of wudu for the entirety of the tawaf. If you break your, your, your wudu after your tawaf and before you do your sa'i between uh, Safa and Marwa, that's all right. You don't need to be in a state of wudu for Safa and Marwa. When someone performs, or when men perform tawaf, for those first three circuits, for the first three cycles that, that you go about, you should be walking briskly and, like a, and, and this is described like a warrior. What does that mean? You should have your arms up, and you should be moving your shoulders a little bit. Now the crowds will be so much that you can't actually move fast, so you're more like doing this in motion. But the idea is, this is a place where a, where, um, a Muslim shows his strength, where a Muslim shows his, um, his, fear, his fe fearlessness, because Allah is with him. And so in the first three, men should be doing this sort of motion where they have their hands up, and they're walking briskly and um, with some seriousness. And then they should bear their right shoulder. So normally your upper garment is going to cover both shoulders. But in this one, you take your, you take your garment and put it underneath. And therefore, your right shoulder will be exposed. And then after the three, you can cover it back up. It's recommended when you pass the black stone in each circuit to kiss it. It's impossible to literally kiss the black stone. If people will fight for hours to get into the black stone, you'll be pushing with all your force. Uh, it's, it's not a good um, situation or other. Um, and because you're in the house of Allah, where uh, sins are magnified and it's a place of great sanctity, to fight in that sort of a place it is a deep sin and really looked down upon. So you really shouldn't um, try to kiss the black stone because this because it'll force you to um, get involved in the fighting and in the rough housing. Instead, what you can do another way of kissing the black stone is when you pass the black stone, you turn towards it, you put your hands to your shoulders, and you face your palms uh, uh, towards it. You say Allahu Akbar. This is equivalent to touching the black stone or kissing the black stone. And you don't have to get involved in the fighting. So you go about seven times um, in, in constant dhikr the entire time. There are specific du'as recommended for certain places. But it's important not to get too caught up in the words of the du'a. There are lots of recommended uh, du'as for different times and places. The one that's most authentic is Rabbana atina fit fit dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa baqina adha bin nar. Allah grant us in this life good and in the next life good and protect us 
uh, from the torment of the fire. So that's the only one I would absolutely memorize and, and make sure that you say it between the Yemeni corner and the Blackstone. All the other du'as uh, will give you some books. It'll have several du'as listed there. Otherwise, just be in a state of dhikr, just be in a state of glorification. Whatever du'as you have memorized, this would be the time for them. After you complete the seven circuits, we'll, we'll all be going in a group, so you won't get lost. We'll all be doing it together. After you complete it, it's obligatory to read two rakahs. You don't have to do it behind Baqam Ibrahim, but it's the sunnah. Again, the, whether we'll be able to or not depends on the crowd and how much uh, space there is. But we'll try to find a space behind Maqam Ibrahim and pray to rakahs. Again, here the recommended uh, prayer is to do Surat al-Kafirun in the first rakah and Surat al-Ikhlas in the second rakah. After that, face the Kaaba, uh, stand up, face the Kaaba, uh, do istighfar, seek forgiveness of Allah, and make dua, and then drink zamzam, and then you finish your tawaf, and you're about to go into your say. Uh, was that all for tawaf? Okay, um, before we get into menstrual periods, um, about the law, any questions? Okay. Okay, so we mentioned with the law, if you have to be in a state of wudu. Now, for menstrual periods, this becomes a bit of an, an issue if your period is going to align um, with um, doing your tawaf or doing your umrah. A few rules about menstrual periods. You can enter into ihram when you're, uh, when you're on your menses. But you cannot enter any mashid, and therefore you cannot perform tawaf. What this means is you don't want to be caught in a scenario where you've entered into the state of, of, of ihram, and then your, your period begins and you can't enter the mashid. Because what that means is you have to stay in, in, in the state of ihram until your menses ends, which will be however long it is. So it's recommended before you leave to plan out exactly when, when it's going to be. If you need to take you know, period blockers or period de delays or something, uh, then talk to a physician and they'll be able to help you out with, with what to do there. If it happens that you are on your period and, um, and you are in a state of ihram and you have to leave Mecca before the period is, is going to end, then you should perform Umrah while still in, in your period, and there's a, ha there's a hefty penalty to be paid uh, with that, and so you just go ahead and, and pay the penalty afterwards. There's obviously n no sin involved in doing it because you had no choice, but uh, there still is a penalty associated. And then we'll move on to Sa'i. Sa'i is walking between Safa and Marwa. Allah says in the Quran, in the Safa wal Marwata min sha'ir Allah, uh, you'll actually see this written uh, when you enter into Safa, there's a dome on top. These are the ayahs that are they're written on the dome. They mean, verily Safa and Marwa are from the rituals of Allah. And whoever venerates Allah's rituals, this is from the piety of the heart. This is from the piety of, uh, of the heart. And so, you begin and end with purity. You begin and end with veneration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The say itself is just the walking between the two hills. When we say seven cycles, a cycle is going from Safa to Marwa is one, Marwa back to Safa is two, and so on and so forth. So you begin at Safa, you'll end at Marwa after seven, and then you'll need to walk and back. In the middle, there are two green columns, and nowadays they've added green lights uh, up top where we're walking. That area is where you need to, where men need to rush or hasten. And so you, you just walk a little, a little bit faster uh, than normal. Again, similar to Rama, which, which you mentioned, the, the warrior walk is meant to show the strength of the Muslim and that and there's a fearlessness that Muslims are commanded to have. At each hill, at Safa and Marwa, it's recommended that you stand and, and, and supplicate and make uh, dua and to, and, and to spend time there not be rushing through these rituals. And then lastly, the haircut. After you finish your, your say, then um, we'll go back and then there are barbers underneath the clock tower, which is probably where, uh, where we'll go. 
You have the option, men have the option to either shave their head entirely or to trim. A trim means you're going to remove one inch of hair from all sides of your head. If you have less than one inch, then you have to shave. It is highly recommended to, to, to shave in any case. It is highly recommended to shave in any case. The trimming is uh, allowed, though, if people want to do that. While in a haram, you can't cut your own hair. You can't cut your own hair and you can't cut someone's el someone else's hair, which is why you have to have a barber do it, do it for you. Uh, as, as my dad explained, for women, what that means is either if you're going with your husband or, or someone, he'll have his hair cut, and then he'll cut your hair, and then you can start cutting other women's hair, and it just continues in a cycle from there. And after you've gotten your, your hair cut, then you've reached the end of your ihram. Your ihram state has ended, and all of the prohibitions that were placed upon you have been lifted. Now... Any questions about Sa'i or, yeah. Uh, they usually charge about 10 dinars or so. 10, 10, yeah, 10, 10 reals, so it's not expensive. Uh, a little, little bit more. We can yeah. finish it all okay. Any other questions about say or the haircuts or other requirements? Okay. Uh, the last thing, just just a short thing about visiting Medina and visiting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made his hijra. To Medina. Uh, the place of Medina changed names from Taiba to Medina and changed names to Medina to Munawwara specifically. Taiba means illness. Uh, when, uh, uh, there's, 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 sorry, it changed name from Yathrib, sorry, to, um, to Medina to Munawwara. Yathrib means, means illness or disease. And so the Prophet, the coming of the Prophet وسلم, was like the coming of a light or the coming of a healing. And while he is there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the place is still a place of light and a place of healing. The, um, when you're in Mecca and Medina, you might be tempted to explore the Mashrid, which is fine. But the secret of Mecca and Medina is, in Mecca, the secret is the Kaaba itself. And so ideally, what, what you'll be doing every day is going to the Kaaba, at the very least seeing it, if not doing uh, Tawaf or around it. All the blessings of Mecca come from the Kaaba. Similarly, in Medina, all the blessings of Medina come from the grave of the Prophet Everything that happens in Medina is from the blessings of that one place. There is a consensus among scholars and Ijma that the holiest physical substance in the world is not the Arsh, it's not the Kaaba, it's not the black stone. It's the soil touching the blessed body of the Prophet um, When we give salams to the Prophet وسلم, you'll enter through this gate. This gate is known as Bab al-Salam, the door, the door of Salam. It's right at the front of the masjid uh, in, in Medina. So you'll, so you'll enter through here, or there might be some other entrance depending on what sort of uh, obstacles they've, um, the, the Saudi officials have placed. But, but more or less, you'll, sorry, yeah, for, for men, for women, you'll enter from the other side. And you'll go through here. At the end uh, will be the graves of uh, Sayyidina Rasulullah uh, first, and then Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and then Sayyidina Umar. Uh, when you greet them, you should greet them knowing that they can hear you. As it confirmed in the in the Quran and in, in several places, including Wala Tasabana Ladina Kutilu fi Sabilahi Amwat, Bal Ahyaun and Rabbihim Yurzakun. Allah says, Do not think that those who are killed in the way in the way of Allah, and this includes the Prophet, وسلم, do not think them dead. No, they are living, given provision with their Lord. 
It's also known that the um, that the Prophet وسلم, in a Sahih Hadith said that he is shown in his grave uh, the actions of his Ummah every Friday. And if he finds uh, what he's shown pleasing, then he praises Allah. And, and if he finds uh, what they have done displeasing, then he seeks forgiveness uh, for them. When you meet the Prophet وسلم, you're meeting him. This is important to understand. He, um, the idea of being living is the idea of someone who responds to stimuli. That's the biological definition, and then our, our, uh, our own scholars had a similar understanding. And Allah said about the Prophet uh, Mubina. Verily, we have, we have opened for your sake a great opening. Verily, we have opened for your sake a great opening. In other words, every opening is through the key of the Prophet if you ever, if there's anything that you feel like is locked in your life, you bring that to the Prophet وسلم, when, when you meet him. If there's anything that you feel like is difficult in your life, that's what you bring to the Prophet وسلم, when you meet him. Um, uh, Allah says in the Quran, "Walla anhum idhalamu anfusum jauka fastaghfir Allah, wastaghfir alhum al Rasul, la wajd Allah tawab al Rahima." Allah says, when they oppress themselves. Had only they come to you and sought Allah's uh, forgiveness, and had the Messenger وسلم, sought forgiveness for them, then they would have found uh, Allah Tawab al Rahima, relenting of their sin and merciful upon them. Notice what Allah is telling you that you go to the Prophet, وسلم, and in that blessed location, that's where you seek Allah's forgiveness. So, Acceptance of du'a, acceptance of forgiveness, comes when you do it paired with and coupled with the Prophet وسلم, either physically in location or in heart or something like that. And so there's a great blessing in being uh, in, in Medina. Like, like we mentioned, um, the uh, sins in Medina are, are very weighty, just like sins in Mecca are, are, are very weighty. And they're especially weighty on the Prophet وسلم, because he said, because Allah says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ Verily, there has come to you a messenger from amongst your, yourselves. Else, what distresses you is weighty upon him. حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ He has, he's, he has earnest for you. بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ He is kind and merciful to the believers. And when you send salawat on the Prophet وسلم, what does it mean? You're, I, I send prayers on the Prophet وسلم, and send blessings on him. What does that mean? Prayers and blessings. Our scholars tell us salah comes from the idea of tasliya. Tasliya is to burn away. When you come to the Prophet وسلم, you're sending prayers on him in, in the sense of you're burning away everything that's contrary to him. You're burning away everything that's not from his sunnah. And you're saying, and you're sending peace upon him. Peace meaning, meaning you are safe from us, you have peace, that we won't contravene your, your sharia, Ya Rasulullah. And so every time you're sending salawat on the Prophet, وسلم, you're promising him to stay true to Allah's commandment and to his commandments. And that's why specifically in, in, in that place to do any sin is to offend the Prophet وسلم, himself and he is forced to ask forgiveness for you. Um, you know, uh, any last questions before we end? In terms of Mecca or Medina or the Umrah itself. The last thing I wanted to, to, to mention, books to prepare from. The first book, The Accepted Whispers, um, is by Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanwi. It has, it's a collection of pretty much all of the du'as in the Quran and the Sunnah. So I'd recommend everyone guess this. Um, uh, it, it'll, it'll be available on Amazon or, or, um, or anywhere like that. Amazon or, or, 
or, or if, you're, if you're having trouble, we can find you copies. The second book, um, this is for people who want details about the fiqh of, of Hajj and Umrah. This is by Sheikh Nur al uh, who is a famous uh, Sheikh, uh, Shami Sheikh of the previous century. He collected this brief manual to talk about all the rulings related to Umrah and Hajj, as well as the du'as related. And then the last book, the Hajj and Umrah book, compiled by our own local Ustad Layla Fakira, um, we'll be passing out uh, copies of those, and those are just du'as for specific locations in Hajj and Umrah. Muhammad it seems like they've started praying, so let's head over.